everyone. Welcome to STEAM for Tweens. I'm Miss Jennifer here at the Warrington Library. In today's program, we're going to talk about some different aspects of crime scene investigation. If you picked up your supplies here at the library, we gave you a packet of activities to practice your detective skills at home. You'll just need a pencil with an eraser, a ruler, and optionally, a washable ink pad. Forensic science is a branch of science that helps solve criminal investigations by collecting, preserving, and analyzing scientific evidence from crime scenes. Today, we're going to talk about some of the ways this is done. Fingerprints are the most commonly collected type of evidence. Fingerprints are the impressions left by skin ridges on human fingers. These patterns often look like loops, whorls, or arches. Because fingerprint patterns are unique to a specific person, they are a very reliable way of identifying a suspect. There are different types of fingerprints that can be left behind. Fingerprint imprints in a soft surface, such as wax or soap. A patent fingerprint visible to the naked eye, such as fingerprints resulting from dirty hands and latent fingerprints, which are invisible, but still present as a result of the oil and sweat that your skin produces naturally. To make them visible, you have to find a way to detect one of these substances present in the invisible fingerprint. The easiest method is called dusting, in which you use a very fine powder that can stick to the oil in the fingerprint. Once the fingerprint becomes visible, you can lift it from the surface with clear tape and transfer it to another surface to then take it to the laboratory to analyze further. Many factors determine the quality of a fingerprint on a surface. One of the most important factors is the surface texture. Fingerprints are most easily detected on smooth, non-textured, and dry surfaces. The rougher or more porous the material, the more difficult it will be to get good fingerprint evidence. Another factor is the condition of the skin on your fingertips. If it is very sweaty and oily, you are more likely to leave behind prints than if it is nice and clean. Of course, wearing gloves also prevents leaving behind fingerprints. You can examine your own fingerprints at home. If you picked up a supply bag, you can use this fingerprint identification template uh, to record your prints. If not, you can just use a regular piece of paper. You can use a washable ink pad if you have one, or just make a really dark scribble with a pencil and use the graphite from the lead, or rather it's not lead, it's graphite, um, but you can use that uh, to put your fingertip in and make your fingerprint. Um, it can get a little messy. So I did mine before filming. Uh, when you do this at home, make sure you wash up well before touching other services as you will leave evidence behind. When a per perpetrator hides evidence of a crime, such as using a cloth to wipe away any fingerprints before leaving the scene, he may think he has covered his trail. He may not realize the impressions his shoes or car tires make could also be used to link him to the scene of the crime. These footwear and tire track impressions are referred to as pattern evidence because the impressions form a unique pattern. Shoes and boots leave prints and impressions specific to their particular brand, style, and size. The tread on each tire of a vehicle may provide investigators with similar information. You can sketch the tread of a pair of shoes you have or design a tread of your own on the shoe sole worksheet we provided in your supply bag, or you can just do that on a plain sheet of paper. Shoe prints can also determine the entrance or exit points at a scene, crime scene, the direction of travel, or how the suspect was moving, like running or limping. Shoe prints can be analyzed to determine the suspect's type, size, and brand of shoe, as well as individual characteristics, such as wear patterns that form on the shoe depending on how the wearer walks, or specific damage like nicks and cuts. 2D impressions, like a dirty footprint on the floor, can be lifted using techniques similar to fingerprinting. 3D impressions like tire tracks and shoe prints discovered in soft surfaces like dirt, sand, and mud are preserved by photographs and a process called casting. A cast of the indentation is made by pouring a substance into the impression, letting it harden, and then removing it 
providing a cast of the print on the ground. Without cleaning the cast or brushing anything off it, detectives put the cast into a cardboard box or paper bag and transport it to the lab, where it can be further examined for evidence such as soil, tar, or other materials that might reveal where the suspect has been. At a crime scene, there are often tiny fragments of physical evidence such as hairs, fibers from clothing or carpeting, or pieces of glass that can help tell the story of what happened. These are referred to as trace evidence and can be transferred when two objects touch or when small particles are dispersed by an action of or movement. For example, paint can be transferred from one car to another in a collision or clothing fibers can be left behind at a crime scene. This evidence can be used to reconstruct an event or indicate that a person or thing was present. If you picked up your supply bag, you received eight different color cards with glitter taped to them. And we are going to pretend that these are trace evidence samples from a crime scene. You should examine each one and compare them to each other. While at first glance, they may all appear to be silver glitter, what differences can you find upon closer examination? So here they all are, and you can get a better look with the ones that you have at home. Um, while at first glance, they may all appear to be silver glitter, what differences can you find upon closer examination? Are some different sizes or shapes? Do they reflect light differently? Are some samples mixed with other types of glitter? Try using a magnifying glass to get a closer look, hold them under a light or out in the sun. Investigators have to be thorough in their evidence examination to make sure they don't miss anything crucial to solving their case. All right. A black light gives off harmless ultraviolet light, UV light, that is invisible to humans. Certain fluorescent substances absorb ultraviolet light and re-emit it at a different wavelength, making the light visible and material appear to glow. Forensic scientists use ultraviolet light at crime scenes to identify materials based on our knowledge of what materials contain these fluorescent substances. What you see glowing under a black light are phosphors. A phosphor is any substance that emits visible light in response to some sort of radiation. A phosphor converts the energy in the UV radiation from a black light into visible light. Forensic scientists use ultraviolet light at crime scenes to find saliva, blood, or urine. Although blood does not glow under a black light, it reacts with a chemical called luminol that does fluoresce. So it can be detected after this reaction using ultraviolet light at a crime scene. Black lights can also be used to discover counterfeit notes that don't contain the fluorescent symbols included in legal bank, bank notes. Bank notes, especially high value bills, often glow under ultraviolet light. For example, modern US $20 bills contain a security strip near one edge that glows bright under a black light, or bright green, I should say, under a black light. Cleaners and laundry detergents also glow under black light, so they can be used to determine if extensive cleaning has been done in the after aftermath of a crime. So you all have a little tiny black light in your bag, and you can sort of see it glow purple on my hand, but if my hand were to have any evidence on it, then it would glow a bright green. So you can play with that a little bit at home and see what evidence you can find. Other evidence may be found that requires the help of document examiners. Document examiners investigate handwriting to find out if documents are forged and to determine the authenticity of a written document. When analyzing handwriting evidence compared to confirmed samples of a sus suspect's writing, forensic scientists look for particular characteristics that can be used to distinguish the identity of the writer. When someone attempts to disguise their handwriting, unique characteristics in their writing may still be identifiable. Clues lie in the writing instrument, the type of pen or pencil, 
and the paper written on, content, spelling, grammar, and punctuation. So I have an example here of, now in this case, it's different fonts from a computer, but this will give you an idea of just how many different ways there are to write the same thing. This says, give me the money, tens and twenties only, no tricks or else. And you see some of them are all caps, some are not, some are in more cursive style and some are block print. So you can see why that would give um, the uh, investigators a lot of information there to work with. And some of the characteristics they're looking for include letter form, which are, are the curves, slants, and proportional sizes of letters. Um, so the relationship between the size of the short and the tall letters and between the height and the width of a single letter, the slope of the writing and the use and appearance of connecting lines or links between the letters. Um, a person may form a letter differently depending on where the letter, letter falls in a word. So the beginning, middle, or end. Um, analysts will try to find examples of each letter in each placement. There's also line form, which includes how smooth and dark the lines are, which indicates how much pressure the writer is applying when writing and the speed of the writing, and also formatting. This includes the spacing between letters, the spacing between words, the placement of words on a line, and the margins a writer leaves empty on a page. It also considers spacing between lines and if strokes form words on one line intersect with strokes in words on the line below or above it. Your supply bag includes a handwriting evaluation exercise. You can compare the handwriting in a note find, found at the crime scene uh, to the samples that we've given you um, to see which sample is the correct match. Now, remember, you're looking for the letter form, line form, and formatting characteristics we just discussed. I'll hold this up to the camera so that those of you without a bag can still try at home. So there's our sample that is from a letter left at the crime scene. And here are some possible writing samples from suspects. What do you think? Does one look like a match? Once investigators have an idea of what their suspect looks like, forensic artists can begin composing police sketches. The eyewitness interview is the most important step in the police sketch process. Officers or artists doing the questioning need to understand what to ask and how to approach interviewees to gather the most accurate information, since the human memory for faces can be easily fooled. Often, people have a difficult time recalling specific facial features, and the more time that lapses between a crime and the police sketch interview, the fuzzier those memories become. Police departments without the resources to retain a forensic artist could instead purchase computer software to automatically generate facial composites by selecting from a gallery of profiles and traits. And it might end up look something, looking something like this. Now, this is not an actual suspect, but that gives you an idea of what a sketch might look like. The interviewee is asked to start by recalling as many specific details about the criminal as possible. Often, participants begin by discussing hair and general face shape. Then, the forensic artist will ask the interviewee about any defining features they don't immediately remember. While forensic artists keenly focus on minute facial features, victims often provide broader descriptions, such as a horse face or bug eyes. The role of an adept artist is to break down vague generalizations into a collection of specific facial characteristics. Artists will highlight standout features like a scar or a tattoo or facial hair that might jump out at a passerby. As the sketch takes shape, interviewees will also begin to show uh, either recognition or point out discrepancies. You have a half done police sketch in your supply bag and you can use the portion provided to finish the drawing on this side. Then use a ruler to answer the provided questions and determine key characteristics of your suspect. I hope that you enjoyed today's program. Come by the library to check out these books 
featuring more information about crime scene investigations. We'll be back with more STEAM for Tweens in 2024. In the meantime, head over to our website, falkirlibrary.org. Click on the research button and select science, math, and environment from the list shown. There you'll find Science Online, a resource featuring articles, videos, experiments, and activities to enjoy on a range of scientific topics. Thanks for watching.